More than four billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, Lethal Legacy. Past conflicts have left parts of Thailand littered with landmines. We join a team on a risky mission to get rid of them. Fire in the hole! And from enemies to peacemakers. How former adversaries in Lebanon's civil war came together to work for peace. إنه بعد نهاية الحرب كنا نطمح بدايتها إنه نعمل وطن ديمقراطي معادل إلى ما هناك من شعارات هذا ما تحقق منه شيء بالعكس زدنا تدمير الوطن. I'm Martin Low and this is Assignment Asia. Welcome to the program. Wars may end, but they always leave remnants behind. Here in Thailand, long ago battles have left large tracts of land littered with mines. Today, landmines continue to kill and maim the innocent, prompting efforts to rid the country of this deadly legacy of war. At Buntarik, on Thailand's border with Laos, I witnessed a team of D miners take on the perilous job of making their land safe. We're searching for landmines. Suddenly, they're all around us. We're in the middle of a minefield. Soldiers begin sweeping the ground with detectors. When the machine beeps, they know they've found one. The spot is marked with a red triangle. Then, slowly and gently, they brush away the soil and leaves to expose the bomb. This mine is big enough to kill. Carefully and methodically, the firing pin is unscrewed and the mine is made safe. There are mines everywhere here. Some have already been uncovered, but are still live and dangerous. Many, many more we're finding as we go along. Thailand, like most countries today, has banned the use of landmines. But these weapons have been in the ground for 40 years, abandoned after long ago battles, and they're still deadly. When enough have been recovered, they're blown up with modern day explosives. They let me fire the charge. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! An NCO is leading today's operation at a place called Buntar Rik on the Thai-Laos border. He's been in bomb disposal for nine years. In that time, he's made safe 10,000 landmines. He says training overcomes the fear. These bombs were planted to kill and maim enemy soldiers in war. But today, it's civilians who suffer. We boon rats stepped on a mine while cutting bamboo in a forest near her home on the Thai-Cambodian border. Her left foot was blown off. She shouted to others to keep away so they wouldn't set off more mines. Then, in agony, she crawled to them. In a minefield, there's nowhere to hide. Unseen and unheard, the mines wait for the unwary or the unlucky. If a mine is triggered, there's a click followed by the roar of an explosion. The result in almost every case is death or disfigurement. 
It's the reason why landmines are amongst the most feared and most hated of all weapons. Thailand is encircled by landmines. Millions were planted on its borders with its neighbors, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Malaysia. They sit just a few centimeters below the surface, forgotten from long ago conflicts with neighboring states and warring rebels. Clearing jungles, forests, and tracks of this deadly menace is the job of the Thailand Mine Action Center, or TMAC, a specialist unit of the Thai Armed Forces. TMAC says 500 square kilometers of the country remains uninhabitable, contaminated by unexploded mines. In the years since the fighting ended, as many as 4,000 Thais have been killed or injured by landmines, 19 from April 2017 to the following year. In the war time, when the soldier, one soldier steps on landmine, they may lose their limbs, their arm, or even dead. This will cause delay for the unit, cause demoral of the unit as a, as a whole. But now today, when the people step on the mine, they, they, they injure not only the people, but all his, of his family will suffer that too, especially if that people are the leader of the family. Wounded civilians are common at hotspots like this, Aranya Pratet, on the Thai-Cambodian border. This region was one of the most heavily mined on the planet. Each of these men has lost part of a leg. In every case, they were carrying out ordinary, everyday tasks when disaster struck. They say even worse than the horror of being blown up was that afterwards they couldn't work or take care of their families. They've just told me something that's really quite sad. They say that after being injured, they were often shunned or ignored by their neighbors. Now that's because in villages where everyone is poor, people stay away from the disabled because they're worried they'll be asked to supply help or money which they can't afford. We Boonrat says many landmine victims talk of ending their lives. <laughs> It's not just people paying the price for landmines. Animals too suffer terrible injuries. Severe wounds are inflicted on elephants roaming Thailand's border forests. Most of them, their whole leg was blown off and it's just like you know shredded and imagine that even though they have enormous size but the pain is much great if it were a human being you could die on the spot but uh, for elephants you know the pains are so great that they can it's almost miracle that they can in endure the pain until they arrive here The Friends of the Asian Elephant Hospital in Thailand's Lampang province is the first in the world to fit prosthetic limbs to elephants. At the beginning, the prosthetics were basic, but as the hospital gained expertise, the limbs became stronger and more comfortable for the animals to wear. Before, an elephant which lost a leg would almost certainly die because the animal's unevenly distributed weight would twist its spine. Now it's hoped some can be saved and learn to walk short distances on their artificial limbs. Sometimes that's something not even injured humans can do. Tala's leg was severed at the thigh in an explosion on a track she'd walked a hundred times before. She still has to use crutches because wearing a prosthetic limb is too painful. 
เป็นยังคือมาเป็นมา,มาเหยียบค่ะเพราะว่าเหยียบทีว่าร้ายคนไปก็เหยียบมาถือกล่องนะคะอีแม่ยางไปมันเหยียบถือกล่องจังหวะพอดี At this free workshop in Nam Yuan, a border area where casualties are amongst the highest, they fitted prosthetic limbs to more than 300 people from surrounding villages. Two of the staff are also landmine victims. Clearing mines is dangerous work, but before they can be removed, they have to be found. Some mines were laid without records being kept, and when there are records, they've often been lost in the fog of war. And when the monsoon rains come, the ground turns to mud, and the mines can move and shift position. Timak had its own tragedy. Four of its D-miners were killed in a single blast while trying to defuse a landmine at Sakel, a short distance from here. Soon afterwards, another D-miner was killed. The losses have been kept secret for four years, now being revealed for the first time. We have uh, five people, five victims, all of them are the people, are the deminer. Both of them are, are my, my people who do the job along the border. No matter how good the training or how much experience they gain, there's no doubting the measure of risk involved in setting out to rid Thailand of its landmine legacy. And there are so many mines in the ground, there's simply no end in sight to the dangers they pose. But the team leader has a simple philosophy. And he ends with this question, if we don't do the job, who will? Under the terms of the Ottawa Treaty on Landmines, Thailand had hoped to clear all of its remaining mines by the end of 2018. But given the scale of the undertaking, that simply won't be possible. The country is now being given until 2023 to complete the task. Next on Assignment Asia, former opponents in Lebanon's civil war unite for peace. Almost three decades after Lebanon's 15-year civil war ended, bitter divisions linger in Lebanese society. But some are trying to heal the wounds of conflict, among them the very people who once fought each other. Natalie Carney met former fighters from opposing sides who are now working together to prevent their turbulent history from repeating itself. Many believe your future is defined by your past. Powerful words a group of former fighters in Lebanon live by. Between April of 1975 and October 1990, Lebanon erupted into a brutal civil war that pitted different religious communities against each other with economic interests and left-right political divides. The war saw rapidly changing alliances, large-scale massacres, and the invasion of the country by both Syria and Israel. While the signing of the TIF agreement in 1989 brought about an end to the fighting, it was not before more than 150,000 people had lost their lives and hundreds of thousands more wounded. For everyone, peace came too late. The war had devastated the country's infrastructure, economy, and displaced a third of the population. Even so, more of those religious and political tensions still remain today, prompting some to ask if anything was learnt from those dark days in Lebanon's history. I was responsible about nine miles southeast of Beirut, in the Lebanese mountain area of Sukagar, 
and at Ziad Saad, Selwa Saad, and Gabi Jamal, all former fighters of their country's civil war. It was on this site back in 1983 that the U.S. Navy, positioned in the Mediterranean, fired 338 rounds against a coalition of anti-government Muslim leftist militias. Ziad was in that battle. The, the battle, the main yeah. battle, it was here, in here, this Here, in this castle. Yeah. No more castle because yeah. it was bombed. I used to come and play when we were child. We came here and play in the, in the castle. It was a very nice place here. We had a lot of friends and friends who were in the family with them. They changed their lives and changed their lives. مثل ما كمان غيروا من الاخرين اللي ما بعرفهم كمان استشهدوا هون لك الحياه بتكفي ايه زياد was inspired to join the war by his grandfather who was revered for resisting the French mandate in 1925 so at the tender age of 15 he joined the Lebanese Communist Party بالاشتراك بالقتال من اول يوم اللي اتفق على تسميته بدايه الحرب الاهليه ب 13 نيسان 1975 استمريت بداخل الاطار العسكري لوصلت لموقع المسؤوليه بحزب الشيوعي اللبناني. At the height of his war days, Ziad was commanding as many as 500 fellow militants, such as Selwa Saad. Selwa grew up just across from that now destroyed castle and also has strong memories of her time in the war. هي بطاقة الجامعة أول مرة فتحت على الجامعة. وقت صار في بين الشيح وعين الرماني. فاجوا على الجامعه انه صار في قواص على بتذكر اسمه محمود يعني شهيد سقط على بعض البوسطه تبع عين الرماني فاذا بدك تزيد الغضب عندي الانجر يعني فالتحقت بمركز بمركز اذا بدك متطوعين انه انا مستعد اساعد بمحل ما هيدا كان بال 75 يعني بدايه الحرب الاهليه اذا بدك كان عندي هاجس انه على طول لاثبت حالي انا كمرة بقدر اعمل كل الوظائف اللي بيعملها الرجل. زياد vividly remembers an eight year old boy he used to play with near the front line. مرة كنا مستعجلين وما وقفنا وسلمنا عليه وقطعنا الطريق فلحقنا لانه متعود انه نحن نلعب نحن وياه فاصطادوا القناص سمعنا صوت سمعت صوت رصاصة طلعت وراي شفته بالارض كان لحقنا لحد هلا بعرف انه مش انا المسؤول اخر شيء اللي قتله هو القناص بس بحس بمسؤوليه لانه لو ما كنت اقدر آه لو ما كنت امرق ولعبه يمكن ما كان لحقنا فهي اكثر ذكرى قليمه لالي بالحرب 11 سنه سلوى lost her first love and her best friend in the war بعد ما توفى محمد فكان آه اسمه جمال عياش هيدا الصديق يعني انه ليلتها اخذني وصار يغني لي كل الليل زهره الصبار يا سلو بعدين بعد فتره انه صارت حرب الجبل انه انتقلت الحرب للجبل كمان طلعت على الجبل بمعركه من احدى المعارك بين علي والكحالي وكان جمال قائد ليلتها سهراني انا وياه بتذكر وكنا عاملين مجدر عم ناكل انا وياه مجدر قال لي مجدرت امي اطيب اشتقت لها لامي عبسيه صارت الحرب وهيدا عم بحكيك بال بالاخر 75 76 يعني هذيك الفتره قال لي صارت عبسيه كثير فاجئني وحكى لي عن عن حاله انه اشتاق لصاحبته وانه بكره بده يروح على الطريق فمات ليلتها بهيدا الاقتحام disturbing memories of the civil war still haunt every single Lebanese upward of 150,000 people were killed during those 15 years of conflict another 17,000 are still missing or unaccounted for while more than 1 million people were displaced Lebanon's capital, Beirut, bore the brunt of it all, and to this day remains an open-air museum to those horrific memories.
During the Lebanese Civil War, this was the so-called Green Line. This side of the street was the Muslim side. That side was the Christian side. But in reality, it was never that black and white. Gabby, a Christian who had fought with a coalition of Muslim and Palestinian fighters, says the war was much more about ideology than religion. One day, Gabby was kidnapped by a Muslim militia who handed him over to the Christian militia in exchange for some Muslim hostages. My own side that I was fighting for, they handed me over to the Christian side, which was at that time my enemy. The problem here that I was a Christian fighting with the other side against the Christian area. The Druze in Lebanon are considered one of the country's five Muslim communities. So once Gabby's loyalties were confirmed, he was released. So I was taken from three different militia in less than 10 days. Yeah, I was like the Beliarco Bowl going around between militias. Some people were fighting to change the government. Others were fighting to maintain it. Then other countries got involved to support one side or the other. This all spiraled into tit-for-tat fighting, revenge killings, and eventually large-scale massacres. We were like full of hatred to, other, to the other side and we were like ready to kill and we were full of strong feeling against the other. We didn't even think for a moment that yes we can live with them, that we can talk to them. It was us or them. It was only after the war ended in the 1990s that the damage could be assessed and it was devastating. The economy has witnessed a modest recovery, and much of the country's destroyed infrastructure has been repaired, but many lives have not, especially for the estimated 200 to 250,000 former fighters. No psychological help was ever provided to ex-combatants, nor were there any programs developed to help them reintegrate into society. Post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, was not a disorder recognized at the time, and without any psychological help, former fighters are still struggling to rebuild their lives. ما تعلموا من الحياة إلا كيف بينزلوا المبنى كيف بيدمروا وما تعملوا ما تعلموا كيف بيبنوا حتى إن الجيش. In 2013, when violent street clashes erupted in Lebanon's northern city of Tripoli, many feared that the country would plunge into another civil war. Ziad, along with other ex-combatants, knew it was time to start speaking out about how war had changed their lives and setting an example for the youth of Lebanon. With this, the organization Fighters for Peace was born. عبر تطرية قلوب المقاتلين السابقين. ليش عم بحكي عن المقاتلين السابقين؟ لأنه مثلي ومثل غيري من المقاتلين اللي بالجمعية في ألاف إذا ما قلنا عشرات الألاف ما زالوا على قيد الحياة. وهول بعدهن عندهم لأنه مصاري في مصالح وطني حقيقي لأنه مصاري في عدالة انتقالية حقيقي. فكل حدا منهم. بيعتبر حاله انه هو كان البطل هيرو تبع المجتمع تبعه مره بالشارع مره بالمدينه مره بالحي هو البطل وبنفس الوقت هو ما عنده رؤيه للمستقبل فاذا بتشلحوا هالافكار وما كان في عنده رؤيه للمستقبل بيوقع بالارض فتصور هيدي الطاقه اللي عنده اياها يحولها من موعع انه هو البطل since 2014, around 45 former fighters from various militias have joined Fighters for Peace, but it has been challenging to get everyone to face their former rivals. It wasn't easy. I mean, I want to be able to get my mind to get out of it. I mean, I want to get out of it. But I don't know what I'm going to do. I took a little bit of time. أخذت شوية وقت ورحت وقت حكيت أزعم قلت له أنه أنه أنا ما كنت مسترجية أريد أحكي معك ما بدي وإذا بدك منهم هيومن شوي تاني يعني هؤلاء الآخرين ف 
فاول التواصل انا وياهم كان شوي حرج لإلي صعب ما قربت يعني بعد شي ثلاث اربع لقاءات مثلا انه لقربت لحد اللي كنت قتلهم مثل مثلا اسعد وقلت له قربت لحد وقلت له لاسعد وحكينا انا وياه يعني قعدنا اذا بدك بلشت اقشع اكثر الجانب الانساني عند الاخر مش الجانب السياسي Fighters for Peace works to bring about the reconciliation between former fighters and between communities through school visits, online platforms, public discussions, and workshops. This morning, they're meeting a group of social workers engaged with at-risk youth in the southern Lebanese city of Sidon. At this table sit complete enemies, former fighters who at one time would not have thought twice about killing the other. أنا برأيي بعرف بعرف الحقيقة من وجهة نظري أنا بس مش هي الحقيقة لأنه غير الآخر اللي رأيه مختلف بالنسبة له عنده رواية ثانية للحقيقة لا بس بدي أحكي بآخر شغلة إنه أنا كنت معتنع عن جد أنا وصغير إنه راح نغير وراح نسوي وكذا وما بعرف فكرنا عم نغير قميصنا بس صراحة أنا بعترف إنه أنا مثل غيري بالآخر اللي عملناه هو إنه دمرنا لبنان في شيء تغير ايه؟ في خي في بيت في حبيب في عزيز علينا قهر في ذكريات قدرناها ومش بس هيك بعد الحرب اللي صرنا 22 احيانا بيخطر على بالي انه لبنان كان قبل احلى من هلا نحن لهلا مررنا من لبنان بحس بمحل ما الفايتر فور بيس رجعني للاجتماعي لانه انه صوتي وشغلي ات كاونتس بمحل صايرة مؤمنة فيه انه هيدا الاتجاه الصح اللي هو السلام. Attendees agree that such discussions are extremely necessary for Lebanon to avoid a repeat of the past. لأنه مثل ما كان عنوان الندوة كي نتذكر كي لا تنعاد أو لا نعود للماضي الشيء اللي شفناه بالماضي ولا اللي عشناه أو اللي سمعناه ما يتكرر هلا لا لإلنا ولا للجيل اللي نحن ضامنينه ما بينفع الندم يعني ما بينفع لأنه بدك تحملها بدك تتحمل تحملها كل حياتك عم نأثر بهذا المعنى نقول لهم نحن كنا بالحرب نعرف ويلاتها نعرف مصاعبها نعرف ألامها ومش جايين من الفضاء نحن أولاد البلد وهيك عملنا بالبلد فبدكم تكرروا التجربة Lebanon is still very much scarred by its past yet now nearly three decades since the end of the war Former fighters are doing what they can to heal some of their past pains in an effort to save their country's future. Natalie Carney, first time in Asia, in Beirut, Lebanon. Lebanon's former fighters vowed to step up their efforts to promote peace and unity as the ongoing war in neighboring Syria threatens to spill over to their country. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Martin Lowe in Bangkok. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia. Share your thoughts and contribute story ideas for future shows by contacting us on social media.